Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform. I'm your host, Jim Roos, founder and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Keeping pace with an increasingly changing marketplace have never been so difficult. No place is this more evident than in creating the IT solutions required for effective digital banking transformation. One way to resolve this dilemma is with low-code and no-code platforms. These platforms provide opportunities for virtually anyone to create business and mobile applications, helping solve the growing skill shortages in banking. I'm excited to have Charles Lamana, Corporate Vice President at Microsoft, on the show today. Charles will share why low-code, no-code is becoming an imperative solution as banking accelerates digital transformation while dealing with skill shortages. So welcome to the show today, Charles. You know, it's never been more important to build cutting-edge, customer-centric digital banking solutions. Today, the creation of new products and services, customer journeys, engagement opportunities can be completed in days rather than months or years, thanks to low-code and no-code platforms. So Charles, before we begin, can you share a bit about what no-code and low-code platforms really are and the benefits they provide? Absolutely. This is probably my favorite topic to talk about these days. Um, one of the things that's great about low-code, no-code solutions is about who it actually enables to create these solutions. Um, so beyond the technology, it's not just IT professionals or coders that can be, develop automations or analyze data or create applications. It's now also people who sit in the business. People who work in the finance department or the HR department or the marketing department can start to build their own solutions in an afternoon or in a day or two to go make the business run more efficiently and get their job done faster. And the way they do that is through these no-code, low-code tools. And they work just the same way, say, office products work. You drag and drop components. You maybe write some simple formulas like you would inside of Excel. And you get a really good visual representation, just like you would see inside of PowerPoint or inside of Visio. And just by wiring these things together, you can start to address and tackle all the most common digital problems that you face in these different parts of a typical banking institution. Um, and that manifest as better employee experience, better customer experience, more efficient operations, all of that um, through that really simple, easy to get started tool. You know, I, I'm from a banking background and, and I remember asking for something to be done by the IT department. You not only have to stand in line, but then you have to worry about, okay, what else takes a priority? You think you're on the scheduling and then all of a sudden it shifts because something else going on. Does this help to alleviate some of that backlog and some of those issues that always were in place around how fast we wanted things to happen, but they just couldn't get done because they couldn't get programmed accordingly? Absolutely. So um, just if you think about how uh, people do data exploration or analysis in Excel, that's not something you go to a central organization to do. Just everybody in the company can crack up, crack up open a, a spreadsheet and start doing calculations and computing values without having to go through a central resource. Low code, no code development is the same idea. Instead of having to go to IT or a coder to go build a solution, you can just do it locally, uh, do it yourself. And that's the big change of being self-service DIY capabilities through these uh, new lo no code, low code tools. So we've been discussing quite a bit on this podcast, the accelerated move to digital due to the pandemic. One thing I hear from a lot of the banking executives right now is it's so hard just to keep up. I mean, they're running really fast, they're getting things done, but it feels like they're standing in place because there's so much to do. In addition, there's skill shortages. I mean, you just can't find the people, and especially in banking where there's so much competition for high, from high tech companies and other companies looking for the same skill sets we're looking for. Does this whole low code, no code dynamic, really is it simplifying the finding of skilled workers to help fill this? I mean, it's just, you know, some of the remote work capabilities and the ability to actually not have to maybe find a full-time um, skilled employee. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think it does it via three main ways. The first is no code, low code helps existing developers, existing coders on staff go faster because it can use it together with other <clears throat> code first approaches. So they can mix and match, say, code they write up in Visual Studio or things they host in Azure or AWS alongside these no code, low code solutions and just build solutions twice as fast. So that's kind of piece number one. The second item is that you have a lot of technical resources which aren't coders. So think about IT admins or IT professionals who can do some scripting, do some configuration, understand technical concepts, 
where they're not going to go write code and host it on a Kubernetes cluster or something like that. That audience is now able to do development with these no-code, low-code tools. You really unlock a whole new set of folks that are already inside your company and outside of it. And the third piece is that self-service business user or citizen developer approach where people who don't normally develop their own solutions can now start to do it with these tools. All three of these combine to start to shrink that skill gap, shrink that labor gap and start to address the huge requirement for more automation, more apps and more data exploration that every one of our customers are struggling with right now. Well, you know, the development of new solutions takes a lot of internal knowledge of, of what the customer base looks like, how they're acting, things of this nature. How do you build a barrier around what you can allow people access to and those things that you don't want them to have access to, even though they need to build these solutions? And this is one of the most important aspects of a successful no-code or low-code strategy, is how do you govern all of these solutions that are going to get built? And folks will tell me frequently that low code has been around for a long time, some say longer than I've been alive, and it's caused a lot of complexity by having this huge debt of thousands of apps that are forgotten running on people's local machines. And even though they may be mission critical, there's no support, no operational infrastructure in place. What's good about this whole new wave of low code solutions is that they're all cloud-based, they're cloud native. Uh, and that makes it possible to have governance policies centrally done by the IT organization, which are applied to all of the end users. So every single app that they build and every single piece of data they analyze and every single bot and automation they create can have to go through a filter of data loss prevention policies, data encryption policies, and even permissioning security policies. That's something which is really different than in the past. And it's something that's actually possible because these low code solutions are now delivered from the cloud, from a central location and start to bring together all the existing assets that you have inside of an IT environment. So it's interesting with the security and risk dynamics, the cloud dynamics, which banking really was slow to get to the, the whole comfort level with cloud for the same reasons, risk and fraud. Um, you were recently quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying in the next five years, there'll be as many apps created as there were in the last 40 years. Do you see this even happening to this scale in banking where everything moves at a snail's pace and where there's so much concern around how, how big do I open the doors? How can I actually make this work? I would say um, I think banking is going to start slow, but finish very fast. And the reason I think that will be true is Banking probably has the best example of end user computing through spreadsheets and data and analytics and data analysis of really any industry. I think if you go out and look and see if find the most complicated Excel spreadsheets and the most complicated Excel deployments and the most usage of Excel, it's probably inside of banking. And what is a complex Excel workbook if not an application? So by changing the frame a little bit, and instead of thinking of these low code solutions or low code apps being big, complex, hulking solutions, but instead thin, powerful, easily created and easily maintained solutions. It's easy to imagine that this will be the next wave and next generation of end user computing and self-service computing inside of banking. And for that reason, I think it'll start small. It'll go through the hurdles, the acceptance, the compliance checks. But once it gets through those hurdles, it'll take off like wildfire because it has the DNA where people feel empowered and ready to go develop the solutions on their own. And, you know, as I understand it, low code, no code solutions are not like a single person getting down a computer, not always, a single person getting down the computer and, and working on these things. These are actually teams that work together. Um, one of the mm -hmm. changes brought forth by the pandemic was the way we work and how teams can collaborate. Did the pandemic speed the process of a low code environment with the new normal or did it slow it up because it's so much harder to get that collaboration? How, how does this impact the whole no code and low code um, dynamic? So we've seen with our customers a rapid acceleration of adoption of these tools. And um, I would say that's working through, of course, the complexities of virtual collaboration and virtual teamwork and hybrid teams. But the reason that there was such a sharp acceleration is almost every single company has had to deal with new business processes, new workflows and new requirements that they've never seen before in a very short period of time in order to survive. And we saw whether it's in banking or any, under, any other industry, if you didn't respond quickly in the first six months of COVID, 
you were punished harshly from a stock or you know a customer base perspective and what we saw many companies doing is turning to low code to build out these solutions quickly because you couldn't wait for three years and a 10 million dollar budget project to complete you had to find a project that worked right away so people turn to low code to build applications to analyze data to automate tasks and processes to respond to this very new operating environment very new world that we were existing in during the COVID pandemic and we, we've seen that acceleration continue right through as we start to return back to the new normal because we're kind of snapping back to not where we were in 2019 but something new entirely things like hybrid as opposed to yeah. only being in the office for example so it seems to me, as we look towards this new normal, I know that Microsoft had to really invest in a lot of capabilities to allow teams to collaborate, to allow people to use low code and no code. Can you give some examples of how Microsoft has been investing in these capabilities in conjunction with how you're investing in cloud solutions? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have this big concept that we talk about of like a new generation of collaborative applications and things like a collaborative toolkit and we, those aren't terms specific to any individual piece of technology or product, but instead a new concept of creating software and solutions which support virtual and hybrid collaboration by default. And we think that in the past where maybe a lot of collaboration happened by looking to your left or right in your office or in, in the open space where you work, a lot more of the collaboration is going to happen through chat and video conferencing and phone calls. And the reality is that software for the future needs to have that baked in because uh, users are tired of switching between 20 different applications to get their job done. Instead, they want the ability to very quickly and very easily communicate and collaborate right in the context of what, whatever app or whatever process they're working on. So that's a big shift that we're doing. And we think that permeates all parts of software to the same degree that originally the browser-based applications and then mobile applications did in the enterprise. So do you see the IT department no longer working the way it used to, but really going to this model going forward and then working with outsiders, citizen development um, concepts to make this even more robust. I mean, do you, do you see the entire IT department completely shifting the way they do things then? Yes. And the, the way the frame that I like to use in my mind is folks remember the transition where projects went from waterfall to agile and what that meant from a technology change perspective and a culture change perspective and just a day-to-day -day operations perspective. I think citizen development and low code is going to change the same level in terms of how IT groups work. Embracing concepts like the fusion team and uh, where you actually have business users and citizen developers collaborating with IT professionals, as well as empowering business units and business embedded developers to go contribute to solutions is going to become the new way of getting the job done. And for the most enlightened customers that we work with, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like IT organizations of before where they're, uh, I'd say in an ivory tower far removed from the business. Instead, the future is going to be IT far more aligned with the business and not just for sharing requirements, but actively building these solutions. And that's what the technology changes enable through low code and no code. Well, it seems like it's in banking, <clears throat> you have a you have data analytics. We've always used a data analytics or, or recently, but in the last 10, 20 years, really focused on risk and fraud. We're now talking mm -hmm. a lot more about using data analytics and innovation and development in the marketing sense, what I call the building a better experience, building a better customer journey. How do you see low code and no code helping increase the speed of innovation, but just as importantly, because I'm a marketer, helping the marketer actually go to that quantum marketing concept of being able to use data and analytics fast to be able to iterate and provide solutions in an instant? I think part of how this change will happen is what having more proper solutions will enable. And let me expand on that by moving out of Excel spreadsheets and out of email and out of human middleware to do some of the most important processes in any financial institution, and instead moving to a world where you actually have an app for that, even if it's a custom bespoke process that you need and there's nothing available off the shelf, low code, no code makes it possible to bring that structure and that standardization to a proper application solution at a reasonable budget and a reasonable timeframe. And what we see with many of our customers is instead of having all of these 
on the side and ad hoc processes that run so many core parts of the business, it's going to move to a collection of applications which can enforce compliance, enforce validation, and enforce security as you run through these steps. Because far better than depending on training or communication is to actually have technology that makes sure as people run through these processes, the rules, the standards, and the processes are being followed. So we think creating these apps will actually elevate a lot of these uh, pr programs and processes to a model where it's far easier to enforce compliance. And so the flip side of that too, of course, is once you have an application which is generating this data in a structured way, you can start to analyze that data. So that's why, for example, at Microsoft, we talk about low-code apps and low-code BI as being hand-in-hand. -hand. The app generates the structured data, the BI analyzes the data that's generated. So you get compliance, you get conformance, and you get intelligence and insights based on those apps. And I think everybody knows that there are so many processes inside of the bank where they work today that just runs by email and spreadsheet and humans. You cannot put data and AI and intelligence on that. You just can't. You got to build an app for that. So that's the big change and why we think low code actually opens a lot of doors when it comes to these compliance and security conversations as well. So let's so let's say I'm a programmer that I, I work on an individual basis or with a small team and I build a solution for bank A. Does this allow the opportunity for an outsider from the bank's perspective to actually take that solution that, that serves a lot of different needs for multiple institutions and actually take that same application and deploy it at other institutions as well, just open up the whole innovation and programming process across the whole industry so that independent players can actually bring solutions to the table on finan to financial institutions almost immediately? Yes, and it's, through two pieces. The first is of course, complete solutions like you mentioned, but also reusable components. So we're working with a few large banks today for Microsoft's low code offering power platform where they're going to generate reusable components and solutions that other banks can use right off the shelf. And because it's built with low code, it's easy to be customized and tailored for each bank because I think they, they rhyme, these common processes and common use cases rhyme between the banks, but they're never exactly the same. So it's always a solution which is tailored bank by bank. Um, so that's something that we're, we're already seeing in earnest and we're seeing it across both the finished solution as well as building blocks and components which people can reuse uh, inside of solutions they build inside of their own banking uh, scenarios. So you're actually saying you can see institutions building white label solutions that they can actually sell to other financial institutions. Because again, it doesn't matter what you're using, it's still gonna be customized to the individual institution, but this, this really yeah. opens the door for all kinds of innovation and, and programming benefits out there that, that financial institutions can work together on. Absolutely, and one of the things that we think that we're seeing a lot of is, there's kind of like two main types of, I'd say financial institutions, and there's like new fintech and then say banks that have been around for a while. And the, the banks that have been around for a while are going through this big digital transformation and reimagining process. And being able to leverage technology across the board in these no-code, low-code platforms makes it more straightforward and provides a clearer path to be as efficient and as competitive as those digitally native fintech companies. And kind of watching this unfold in the market is one of the most exciting parts of our job because we get to see kind of the, both things happening at the same time. Companies being born in the cloud and companies reinventing themselves in the cloud um, and doing it together in a very collaborative way. What are some of the challenges you see from banks and credit unions who are trying to embrace these platforms to modernize their applications? I mean, how does the power platform and, and things that you're doing in Microsoft help address these challenges? The, the big thing is in order to become or to complete digital transformation, a bank needs to start to think like a, a technology firm to a degree, which means you digitize, you automate, and you bring efficiency through applications for all parts of your business. And to do that, you need developers. And kind of how we started the conversation where there's a huge shortage of developers right now, and every company is trying to go fill those positions and the developers you have are extremely overworked and super busy and oversubscribed. These low code tools like the Power Platform make it possible to start to close that gap with companies which are completely digitally native. So that's where we see the real opportunity because the large financial institutions, 
they have capital, they have expertise, they are highly compliant and manage risk very well, but they're missing and lacking a lot of the apps and the automation and the data understanding. Low code makes the time to close that gap compared to companies which maybe started that way, it makes it a lot smaller and it closes the window. It makes it possible for them to start to deliver world-class employee experience, world-class customer experience, while still preserving the brand and preserving all of the risk com and compliance profiles by using these tools to get solutions built faster than ever before. Now, we, we usually focus this podcast on, on financial institutions, but when you're looking at low-code, no-code, what industries right now are, are more advanced? What industries are doing this really well that are, are good models for other industries? So I said, one of the ones which has surprised me to a degree, but has happened very quickly is around um, pharmaceutical and life sciences and, and chemistry organizations. Uh, and I think that surprised me for two reasons. The first is there's a heavy manufacturing component in addition to heavy information work component. Like you'd have to not only design medicines or design chemicals, but you also then have to manufacture them in giant plants. Um, but the second thing is there's actually a, a high degree of regulation, particularly around life sciences. And we've seen kind of to our earlier things, starting slow, but then going really fast. We've actually seen GXP certification, which is a high, like a big regulation in that industry. Once we got that, we kind of saw a rapid expansion of adoption of these tools because it's a technical community. These are engineers, scientists, who maybe weren't developers in the past that can now solve their digital problems themselves. Um, so that's, I'd say one place which has been really interesting in a very fast adoption curve. Um, and I think financial services is similar in that you have a highly technical, analytical, logical user base that just wants to get these tools in front of them, they're gonna go start to solve their own problems as fast as they can. You know, it's interesting because financial institutions as we know have just reams of data. There's just data, they're, they're not really formed really well a lot of times, they're in silos, things in nature, but really you're, you're to deploy any of these solutions, you need the data. How do we work to make it so that there's a good data quality? How do you ensure that in a low code, no code environment, as opposed to one that's very highly structured within an IT department? How does a power platform help customers manage their data, but ensure that both internal and external data works well with each other? There's a, there's a few pieces to it. The, the first is one of the things that we're very focused on is this idea of data connectors. And what it, it enables is these no-code, low-code solutions are able to connect to data where it already is without having to copy it out of those systems. So that way, if you already have data stored in a highly structured, schematized database or in a SaaS application, these low-code solutions can connect to and operate on the data in its source system. So you don't betray or break any of the security models or data scheme that you created. So data connectors is a big item. Second thing is we provide a highly schematized, highly discoverable data platform inside of our low code offering is something called Dataverse. And it makes it very easy to define and discover reusable data and understand what does a customer record look like or what does an account record look like and that type of thing. So we actually guide these low code, no code developers to use the right data models and store it in the right place with the right security. Then the third piece is one of the things which is a little more futuristic, but which is pretty exciting, which is about converting unstructured data to structured data using some AI capabilities. So we have a bunch of these built into our offering, which helps you do things like take big flat files or big spreadsheets, or even big unstructured catalogs of data like contracts and then convert that into a structured representation. Because once it's structured, you can do analytics, but you can also start to do process and automation on top of it as well. And that third piece is where we think a lot of innovation will happen because it's gonna take a long time to schematize all the data and bring all the data into a data lake in a typical bank or large enterprise. But if you can use AI, you can actually adapt a lot of it and start doing process and, and insights where it already is. So those are the three big items, data connectors, data versus a data platform and AI um, that really are making it easy to take advantage of the data that you already have. Most of our listeners tend to be what I'm gonna say, front office facing employees. They're, they're in charge of marketing, they're in charge of product development. They many times they're in charge of the retail banking ecosystem, but they're not the programmers, they're not the IT people. That's not most, that's not the majority of our listeners. So if I'm an outward facing employee right now, 
why should I care about low code and no code? Why, why does this even make a blip on my screen of awareness with everything else going on? What, what is really in the future and how does this impact me? I would say there is a selfish reason and a business oriented reason. The selfish reason is that we think in the future, many of these front facing roles will need to have low code or no code development as a skill to be successful. Just like you're expected to be able to send emails, do video conferencing or work an Excel spreadsheet or build a PowerPoint presentation, you'll be expected to be able to, to do no code, low code development in the future. I say that's, that's a selfish reason of a mm -hmm. play I'd make. Yep. Second aspect is every single person in any job deals with a ton of repetitive, monotonous systems or applications, which are just mind bogglingly dated and inefficient. What if I told you that you can now actually quickly build your own solution to improve that system today without having to get budget, work with IT or do something, um, I think beg and plead for a big transformation project. You can go find those efficiencies. One of my favorite is every marketing department does a massive amount of data movement. I remember talking to a customer which was telling me that they had 40 people who spent four hours each week just copying data from one system to another to run their marketing campaigns. What if you could automate that in an afternoon? You could spend one afternoon and say four hours for you and everyone else on that team for the rest of the year every week. That's a huge opportunity. And there's probably hundreds of things like that in the department where you work. So you can be a more efficient, more competitive and more digitally capable department in a completely self service and independent way using these tools. And you can develop the next generation of skills that you'll need from a digital and uh, computing workforce of the future, even though you're not a coder or IT worker. So as Microsoft, you're going out there and knocking on doors for financial institutions. You're selling them on the concept that they're going to be able to move faster in a more agile way and build solutions in a more undefined way, but in a way that's going to move them forward twice, three times, four times faster than ever before. That said, and it all sounds great, what is the pushback you get? What seems from your perspective to be the reason why finance institutions may hesitate and may not embrace this? Yeah, I mean, I would say risk and compliance is a common concern. I think we have a very, we've gone through this process with many large banks, including many large GCFE banks, and we've been able to go push through that and get to a good place that makes everybody feel comfortable from the CISO to the risk and compliance officer to the business user. Um, but I would say risk and security is a concern. And second thing is culture and change management. When the personal computer arrived in the workplace 30 years ago, that was a big change for a lot of people. And it didn't happen overnight. And it took investment in training, reskilling, uh, and creating the right environment so everybody would end up feeling comfortable in front of a personal computer. The same type of thing is going to happen for these no-code, low-code tools. It's going to show up. It's going to be a huge productivity boon. But we're going to have to take everybody, take a billion office workers around the globe on the journey to use these tools to do their, their job more efficiently. And, and that just doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen without some effort. So I think mm -hmm. risk and compliance and culture and change management are the two biggest things. The good news is there's a lot of material and a lot of companies that have already done that. Um, Gartner thinks 65% of all enterprise app dev will be done in low code environments by 2024. Power Platform, the Microsoft low code offering is in 97% of the Fortune 500 already. The moment is now, it's happening today. Um, so I think it's uh, resistance is only delaying something that's going to happen just from the workforce bringing it into to work over time. Just so my listeners understand, I did not poke Charles to say this thing, and I didn't prod him or pay him any money to say that it gets down to leadership and culture. But, you know, everybody has to realize, I think more than ever, that this is all new stuff. This is not banking as that usual. It's not what we're used to. It takes a change my mindset. And in addition, in some cases, it's going to take employees to to relearn things or learn things for the first time around things like low code and no code. And, and I think that what you said there is so important because it's not doing things as normal. The good news is we have a good model, I, I believe, from the cloud platform experience where organizations just were pushing back all the time on not wanting to do the cloud and not wanting to move the cloud for the same reason you mentioned about low code, no code. 
However, there's very few organizations now that are hesitating to go into the cloud because they've resolved some of the, the issues that they were dealing with. I think this is another example of this. You know, you know, we've talked about the intricacies and the power of low code, no code. As our last question, you know, can this be implemented by organizations of all sizes? Is this really an ability that really right now is for the biggest organizations only? I'd say every company everywhere is able to take advantage of low code. And that's the beauty of the cloud delivery model. Anyone listening in, in less than five minutes could probably sign up for five different low code products and get started. And what that means is you don't have to have a huge IT budget. You don't have to have an army of developers. You can build solutions today that'll make you run more efficiently. Whether you're a very small regional credit union all the way up to a GCP bank that has to track and report with the Federal Reserve, you can use this tool to be more efficient, stay compliant, and be better for your customers and employees. Well, it's interesting is a, a way to get, you brought up earlier, a way to get your foot wet is to 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 integrate with something that a financial institution, financial institution has already done where they can actually provide you a white label version of something that was developed in low code, no code, but but can be deployed at a, an institution just wanting to, to change the way things are being done. You know, Charles, Thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been a great conversation. As anybody who knows me knows that this is somewhat out of my wheelhouse, but it's something that I'm trying to embrace and understand better because it really is the direction we're going and it solves a problem that I had to deal with 40 years ago, which is working with the IT department to get something handled that in many cases, they didn't even understand what I was talking about. And that's a hard solution to come to when they don't know where you're heading and they're being asked to, to get you there. So thanks again, Charles. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jim. And I'll make you a low code user yet. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Charles, as I said, you know, it's interesting in this podcast today, this is not my comfort zone. It's not something I really understand. I'm getting to understand it more because my son is a business analyst and analytic uh, I, uh, engineer, I guess it is, um, for a pharmaceutical company. But, you know, you, you mentioned, I think, in a, in a pre-call with us around some people that have completely transformed their careers by reaching out and trying to find new ways to learn how to do the things we were talking about. You know, what you mentioned, I guess, some guy at Heathrow or something like that. What was that story? Yeah, so it's kind of amazing what you can learn on YouTube. It's like the YouTube generation. So Samit Saini, who is a security guard at Heathrow Airport, he was able to learn power apps and low code completely on his own just by watching a bunch of different YouTube videos. And now he works full time in IT. So completely reimagining his career and a complete change for him. And that's kind of the thing that gets me most excited about low code is the idea of people who historically couldn't be a developer because uh, they maybe didn't have that background with comp sci or writing code. Now are helping build solutions in a way that wasn't possible before. Well, it's interesting because my son, uh, he wanted to take more and more of the coding. And he said the problem was there just weren't as many teachers available teaching this stuff because they'd all gone to private industry. And to your point, he's learned a lot of what he's doing today by YouTube videos and by other people that he knew doing things. And you, you have to be self-taught. It's a completely different way of learning than what I went through. Um, and. It shows the power of the computers, computer age and all the dynamics. And, and it's kind of interesting because the story you brought up rings rings true at home. So again, uh, yeah. thanks for your time today. I'm, I'm glad we were able to spend some time together. Yeah, of course, I think just maybe one thing to add on that, the, the idea of democratizing learning by making yeah. it available on the internet to anyone, anywhere, that's, that's just amazing transformative power from a workforce perspective. So well, it's funny. I think that will be a big deal in the next five, six years as well. I try to avoid politics in, in the podcast, but it's interesting because the whole dynamic of not having to go to college and there's other ways to learn now than there ever been, I, I think is very valid, especially in the area you were talking about today in the podcast. So I, yeah, thanks a lot again. Um, appreciate everybody at Microsoft for helping us out here. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform. Just raised a top five banking podcast and the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoyed today's show, please give our show a five-star rating on your preferred podcast platform. Also, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and the research we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcasts. A special thank you to producer Leah Longbreak, audio engineer Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, 
that in the past, creating applications provided a buy versus build opportunity. The future of creating applications may be no coding at all.